Jennifer Weiner grew up in Connecticut and graduated with a degree in English literature from Princeton University in 1991. She worked as a newspaper reporter in central Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Philadelphia until the publication of her first novel in 2001, Good in Bed, <laughs> of which over 1.6 million copies have been sold to date. Some of her other best-selling books include In Her Shoes, which was turned into a major motion picture starring Cameron Diaz, Tony Collette, and Shirley MacLaine. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that one. Little Earthquakes, Good Night Nobody, Certain Girls, Best Friends Forever, Fly Away Home, and Then Came You. In addition to writing novels, Jennifer has become the feminist gadfly of the literary establishment, arguing that gender discrimination in publishing is the reason her books don't get reviewed in publications like the New York Times. She's here this afternoon to talk about her new novel, All Fall Down, a remarkably absorbing story that mixes dark humor with an honest portrayal of an addict's struggle. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Weiner to the JCCSF. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for that lovely introduction. A while ago, I did a reading at a bookstore that had had a flood, and they had to relocate the reading to the loading room, which had like a concrete floor with a hole drilled in the center. It looked like Jeffrey Dahmer's Mary Workshop. <laughs> and the bookstore owner was so apologetic about the situation, he could not stop telling me how sorry he was. And they'd never done a reading back there before. He hoped it was OK. And you know, I, of course, as the oldest child of divorced parents, am trying to calm him down. Don't worry. It's fine. Mom and dad still love us, even if they can't live together anymore. And he walks through the crowd, and he stands behind the podium, and he leans into the microphone and says, here's Jennifer Weiner. Sorry about the smell. <laughs> Yes, and, and all I could think of was they usually wait until I'm done before they <laughs> apologize for the smell. But it was nice. I, I signed everyone who came. I signed their books. Thanks for coming. Sorry about the smell. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so glad to be here because I, I've basically been like, um, I, I, I've, been, I've been having some parenting struggles lately. I have two daughters. They're 6 and 11. And the other night we were watching The Bachelor at, you know, as, as you do. And I, um, I, I went out of the room to get a snack or something, and I came back, and my, my six-year-old Phoebe says, Mommy, what is a whore? <laughs> oh, God. And, and, and I, ugh, I, what do I do? So I said, OK, I can handle this. I said, do you remember when Mommy explained to you where babies come from? And she gets this horrified look on her face, but says, yes. And I said, OK, so you know, the daddy gives the mommy the special seed because he loves her. And yeah. And I, and I said, well, there are some ladies who do the thing to get the special seed, not because they're in love or want to have a baby, but they do it for money. And it's such a sad thing because your body is so special. And the thing you do to get the seed is so special that you really should never do it for any other. And she's looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> And then my older daughter says, Mommy, she asked what a poor was. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's totally different. That's just, just forget the whole, forget all of that. For just forget, forget, forget all of it. Oh, yeah. Um, and, then, and then the 11-year-old, OK? So um, her body is going through the magical changes, right? And, and I, I um, I'm trying to talk to her about this. And I'm like, Lucy, we need to talk about puberty. She says, no, we don't. I said, yeah, we do. And no, we don't. So I, I buy her the American Girl doll book, The Karen Feeding of You, which is the book everybody says to get. And I read it. It's terrific. And I put it in her bedroom. And I say, you know, please read this, because this is stuff you need to know. And we'll talk about it. And I, I leave her room. And then I hear this whoosh, thunk. And she throws the book out of her bedroom onto the hall. So I, you know, I, I put the book back, I find it in the trash can. I put the book back, I find it in the koi pond. Like, she just does not. And finally, I'm like, all right, we're going to take a spelling quiz. And she's all about, like, tests and quizzes. Her, her school does not have grades. She goes to, like, this hippy-dippy, crunchy granola school that, that has no grades. So she wants to be, like, tested. So I'm like, all right, you know, spell Democrat. Spell machine. Spell menstruation. And she's like, I'm leaving. And so 
I call her pediatrician because like I'm at the end of my rope, yo. And he says, don't worry, um, bring her for her checkup and we'll take care of this. And so I bring her for her 11 year old well child visit and she's um, on the table and he's looking at her eyes and he's looking at her ears and he's looking at her nose and he says, now Lucy, I can see that your body is starting to change and I can, I can see her start to shut down. And he says, it's very important that you understand what's going on here. She's like, I know what's going on here. He says, well, that's really good because you know, your mom and I really do not want you to be surprised by anything. She's like, I won't be surprised by anything. And he says, well, that's great because, you know, some of it could maybe be kind of surprising. Like, for example, if you didn't know about getting your period and then you were to start bleeding from your vagina. <laughs> and at the words bleeding from your vagina, my child turns the color of skim milk. She had no freaking clue. I don't know what she thought it was, like, getting your period. Like, I think she thinks, like, the booby fairy comes and, like, flies and, like, leaves some breasts under your pillow. And, and, and so, like, we're walking out, and I'm like, Lucy, like, you're busted. You didn't know with that. She's like, I knew. And I'm like, no, you didn't know. Like, why are you lying to me? Like, I just, I, uh, I'm trying so hard to be, like, good mom with, like, the open door policy who, like, will talk to her about anything, and she doesn't want to talk about it. <sighs> Anyhow, um, I, I'm here to talk to you about my new book, I'll Fall Down, and when you're a writer, the question you get all the time is, where do you get your ideas? And I typically say Target, <laughs> because that's where they have everything. And, um, and, and I tell the story of, um, before I was a writer, I was a reader and I grew up in a house full of books, and I had parents who encouraged me to read whatever I wanted to read as long as I could explain, had some clue about what it meant. And I talk about starting my reading career with my father's medical textbooks because there were naked people in them, and how I now know like so much about genitals that like, you know, I'm the best person to watch medical TV shows with because like we'll be watching House, you know, and somebody will come in having seizures and I'll be like, he's got syphilis. And my boyfriend will be like, huh, no, I'm just, oh, wait, just you wait. And sure enough, 45 minutes and two wrong diagnoses later, who's right? Me. Um, so read the medical textbooks, read everything I could get my hands on all through high school, majored in English in college. Um, needed to get a job. I, I graduated in 1991, there was a recession. Um, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I knew I, was, I wanted to write fiction and I approached both of my parents who had been very acrimoniously divorced at that point and said, is either one of you interested in becoming a patron of the arts and supporting me while I write a novel about your divorce and how it hurt? And they both said no. So I'm like, okay, I need to get a job. And I, I figured like, okay, what are the jobs where you get paid to write? And, and I thought either advertising or journalism. And I didn't want to do advertising because I somehow was convinced that no matter where I ended up or what um, ad agency I worked for, I would be assigned to the tampon campaign. <laughs> and my professional life would consist of finding synonyms for the word absorbing. And it's funny the way life works because many, many, many years later, I'd, I'd published some books and a um, feminine protection company got in touch with my agent and my agent got in touch with me and she said, I don't think you'll do this, but I have to run this by you. They asked if you had any interest in being a campus ambassador for their brand. I was like, really? She's like, yeah. I'm like, well, well do I have to dress as a giant tampon? <laughs> and she says, no. I said, well, could I dress as a giant tampon? And she says, no. And I, I said, well, could you give me a couple days to think about this? Because it's really a lot to absorb. <laughs> she says, I'm getting off the phone now. I said, wait, call them back. Find out, are there strings attached? <laughs> so I, I get a job at, at a newspaper in central Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I work there, and then I, I get promoted. I get to move to Lexington, Kentucky. Um, there are Jews in Lexington. I dated them both. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's very nice being at a JCC. Um, I, I like that, I, I joke sometimes that I have uh, uh, different kinds of audiences. I have like the Jewish people who read my books and they get you know the satyrs and the shiva calls and the latke making and all that stuff. And then there are people who think that I'm delightfully exotic, which is really nice. But, but sometimes I'll be like, I, I talked to like the junior league once and I said something about J-date and they all just stared at me. And I'm like, J-date, you guys know J-date? No, for the unchosen chosen people? Any, any, anything, anything, no? So I, 
I go to Lexington, I date both Jewish guys, and then I um, go to the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I, I'm loving life. I, I, um, I'm writing features, which is wonderful, no more hard news, which is good, I was really bad at numbers. Um, I got to cover the Pillsbury Bake Off, I got to cover a presidential inauguration, I got to write about TV, I got to write about books, I got to interview Adam Sandler, and I got to cover the Pillsbury Bake Off which was huge for me because in the 1970s, Nora Ephron, who is one of the people I wanted to grow up and become, wrote sort of the seminal essay about feminism in the 70s and it was centered around the Bake Off, which had been around for 50 years and she was writing about what does the Bake Off mean at this sort of moment of feminist foment? Like who's going, why are they there, what do they believe, you know, what does it mean to sort of cling to a traditional role when women are burning their bras and demanding equality? And so I told I pitched my editors, I said, I'm gonna do this story for the 90s. So I go, I fly to Dallas where the Bake Off finals are being held in the convention center where they've constructed 50 miniature kitchens for the 50 finalists. Now, little Bake Off background. Each finalist has to bake their winning dish three times. Once for the judges, once for the photographers, once for the press, me. And I decided that to write a really great comprehensive Bake Off story, I need to taste everything that, that comes rolling off the line. 50 finalists, I think 49 of them did desserts where like the first ingredient was sugar. And I'm like tasting and tasting and tasting and tasting. And at some point I have eaten so much sugar that I might as well have dropped acid. Okay, like the walls are moving and I can taste colors and like I'm just like out of my mind. And then I noticed that there was somebody dressed up in an inflatable doughboy costume posing with the contestants and I decide that what I need to do is poke the doughboy to see if he giggles. I don't know why I thought this, so it was long ago, but so anyhow, I have, I have, I'm like stalking the doughboy through the convention center, I'm reaching and the doughboy moves away and I'm like almost there and then the doughboy turns and finally I take my pen and I'm stretching and I, I just, I meant to poke the doughboy really gently, but the pen went in kind of hard and then I heard the noise that you never want to hear when you're around an inflatable costume, Psst. shit! So I run, I run, I run to the lobby and I'm like, okay, Okay, be cool. No one saw you, no one saw you, it's fine. And then I realized the pen that I had left stuck into the Pillsbury Doughboy says Philadelphia Inquirer. <laughs> oh my God. I did not get caught. I did not get asked back. So there I am in Philadelphia and I've been dating the, the guy, the nice Jewish boy for three years. And I'm doing the thing that you do when you're dating the nice Jewish boy for three years, which is naming our children and picking out the China pattern in my head. Um, and it occurs to me at some point to say to him, like, are we on the same page with this? And, and it turns out that we are not on the same page with this. And he thinks that we need to take some time and think about things. And I think that sounds very mature. And so I go to Philadelphia to think about things. And he goes back to New Jersey and starts dating someone else, <laughs> which is not thinking but doing. And it's the kind of breakup, because it was a breakup. And it was the kind of thing I think you only go through in your 20s where you don't have enough perspective to, to know that you will love again. And you think that this guy that you weren't sure you wanted to be with, your brain does the thing of convincing you that this is the only man who will ever want you or love you or understand you or want to see you naked. And if you don't get him back, you're gonna die one of those horrifying urban deaths where nobody knows until the smell seeps out from under your door. And um, this was the summer of Titanic. This was 1998. And I just have such vivid memories of driving and weeping and singing in a terrible French Canadian accent, my heart will go on. And finally, I, I said to myself like, okay, what do I know how to do? I'd been a reader my whole life, and I'd been a newspaper reporter, and I thought, I know how to tell a story. And I'm gonna tell a story where the guy is a lot like him, and uh, I'm sorry, the girl is a lot like me, and the guy is a lot like Satan. And, and the girl is going to get a happy ending because I have no idea if I'm ever gonna get a happy ending. And so I write the book, I find an agent, she sells the book, it's this whirlwind, magical, amazing, amazing thing. And, and everybody says that as a writer, like the happiest day of your life is when you get to go home and tell your, your mom that someone is publishing your book. And I'm pretty sure that's true for everyone whose book is not called Good in Bed, okay? 
because I go home and I'm like, Fran, remember that book that you didn't believe I was writing? And she's like, oh, yes, your novel. And I'm like, yeah, the novel. Well, Simon and Schuster just bought it as part of a two book deal. And my mother starts to cry and she gives me a hug and she says, I'm so proud of you. And then she says, what is it called? And I go, shit. I said, good in bed. She says, what was that? I said, good in bed. She says, good and bad. I said, no, no. She says, good in bed? I said, mm-hmm. She says, Jenny, how much research did you do? <laughs> so that's where good in bed came from. And I wanted to talk a little bit about All Fall Down um, because it's, it's, a, it's a teensy bit of a departure. I mean, people, I think that people who aren't like super familiar with my oof, I love saying that. <laughs> My oeuvre. People, people are like, you know, this is, this is like, don't you write like fun beach reads? Like, what, what's with the junkie? And so I, I, I explain to them that I think that, you know, I do write like the, the voice of my books can be funny, can be witty, can be self-deprecating. But I think that there's always been like serious stuff going on, whether it's body image issues, parental abandonment, estrangement from a sibling the difficulties in a marriage when a baby comes along, like all that stuff has sort of been in the oeuvre. So I, I don't feel that this book is a huge departure, but I, I wanted to write about addiction for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is you probably all realize it's a big problem. You can't pick up a newspaper, you can't pick up People magazine. It's, it's a national epidemic. It's, it's specifically affecting women um, and it's kind of, it's interesting because alcoholics, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a blackout alcoholic, you're not getting much done. If you're an addict who's using pills, a lot of times you can be like super duper high functioning. You can be like, you know, you're keeping those balls in the air. You know, you're working, you've got your family, you're working out, you're looking good, and you know, until it all comes crashing down. Um, so I wanted to write specifically about women and addiction and what's bringing them to that place. But the other thing um, is, is I sort of had some real life experience with the issue. Um, my, my father left my mom when I was 15 and he decided that he didn't want to be a husband anymore, which was, there was that going around in the 80s that was happening. But he also decided that he didn't want to be a father anymore. And he told me and my sister and my two brothers, like, just think of me as your fun uncle, which we were all kind of like, ew, no. So for 20 years, my dad would be like in and out of my life. Like we'd be in touch, then we wouldn't be in touch. And, and I knew that he had um, gotten married and, and gotten divorced again while his second wife was pregnant. Um, so I, I knew that things were not going well. And, and I, I knew they were actually going pretty badly, but like, you know, he, I didn't know where he lived. I didn't know how to reach him. And then one day um, in 2008, I was in Los Angeles and Phoebe had just been born. So I'm breastfeeding her with one hand and I'm checking my phone with the other because multitasking. And I see that I have seven missed calls from Rocky Hill, Connecticut. And I don't know anybody in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, so I do the whole like reverse lookup thing and it's the police department in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. And I'm pretty sure I haven't broken any laws in this place I haven't been. And so I call and I talk to this very nice sergeant who says, I'm, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but your father has died. Um, and they called me because I was the next of kin. He was divorced from my mom. He was living with a girlfriend but not married to her and they needed a relative to um, handle the autopsy. There's, there's always in Connecticut an autopsy if somebody dies, like not in a hospital or, or not you know, like in an obvious way, they do an autopsy. So I flew home, I flew back to Connecticut with my sister and my brothers and we met my dad's girlfriend and we were trying to make sense of what had happened because the whole thing just sounded really sketchy. Like her details kind of weren't lining up and the story wasn't making a lot of sense and she was trying to explain that my dad had been diabetic and was not seeing doctors but was trying to treat himself. My dad was a doctor and so she's going through this whole spiel and finally my sister looks at her and says, what was really going on? And I'm bracing myself to hear alcohol. Because I knew my dad wasn't an alcoholic, but he, he would drink. And so I figured, like, this was what happened. And she says, well, for, for many years, your father struggled with, and I'm waiting for alcohol. And she says, crack cocaine and heroin. And I'm like, huh? Like, he wasn't a jazz musician. Like, what the what? The what? He was a psychiatrist. Like, he lived in a house with a swimming pool in a suburb. He drove a station wagon. Like, what? 
happened here? And so um, the whole thing was like this sort of domino chain of awful where it would get bad and you would say to yourself, well, at least you can't get any worse. And then it would get worse. And you think, well, at least not going to get worse now, but it would get worse. Um, we learned that he had died of an overdose, and we, we learned that you know his life had just fallen apart. And his girlfriend was telling the story of, yeah, you know, I had to get a cell phone before the cops could get it because his dealer's numbers were in on the dealers. You know? And then she's like, maybe you could help me go through your father's stuff. And I'm thinking clothing, books. I am not thinking bins of pornography. Like, vats of pornography, like like dumpsters fall. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. And then it was like, you know, porn, 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 box of my books. Like, I didn't know what to make of that. Like, had he read them? Did he like them? Was he like hurt? Like, did he, did he read about the father and good in bed and how that made Canny feel? Like, I don't know. I'm never going to know. And then it was like, you know, porn, 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 my books. And then like, you know, disgusting Polaroids of him with other people. And my sister and I start singing, memories <laughs> like the corners. Anyhow, so, and then we find this stack of letters, unopened letters from the Department of Youth and Family Services in Connecticut regarding unpaid child support. And I'm thinking, okay, well this has to do with, with us or maybe this other child that he had because I know he never paid my mom child support. She was like forever taking him to court. It had to do, every letter said, in the matter of David H. And David H was three. So like in between the crack cocaine and the heroin, my dad had had another kid. And it was just, I was so completely knocked for a loop. And it was this like strange moment in my life where on the one hand, like there's all of this professional success, you know, my books are doing well. But then I had this TV show that sort of flamed out like spectacularly. It was a total disaster. And then I had this parent that's, that's died a really, really bad death. And so I'm thinking, what do I want to show my kids? Like, how do I want to sort of model resilience and strength and show them how to get through a bad time? Um, and I, I thought a lot about, about my, my kids and about being a mom and about, about being a role model. Um, and I, uh, part of this ties in with the New York Times that, that Stephanie talked about and, and my whole like, you know, crusade to like, you know, get them, get them to review um, more women's books. And I, as soon as I was published, I was, I was like, this is great, this is awesome, you know? And then I started noticing, gee, the New York Times surely does not review many books like mine unless men write them, in which case they, they sort of get treated very differently. And isn't this interesting? And I start like asking questions and I start making noise. And um, when you're an activist, like if you're pushing for change, like there, there are people who are invested, as they say, in the status quo. So if you start pushing, you get pushed back. And I, I remember a couple of years ago, the guy who did like the Q&A column for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, every time he had a woman actress, he would either imply or just flat out ask her like, who did you fuck to get your job? Like he asked um, Chelsea Handler, who was dating the head of Eve, like basically accused her of, you know, you're sleeping with this guy to get your talk show, right? And then Whitney Cummings, who had two shows, and he's like, you must be sleeping with lots of people. And then with Tippi Hedren, he's like, well, you didn't want to sleep with Alfred Hitchcock. Well, who did you want to sleep with? And finally, I send this like cheeky little tweet, you know, on like Sunday morning, iced coffee, seeing who Andrew Goldman thinks slept with someone to get ahead, you know, really sick of this. And he tweets back, at Jennifer Weiner, little Freud and me thinks you're jealous that you did not have this path to success yourself. Meaning, no one wanted to sleep with you. And I'm like, holy shit, the New York Times just said no one wants to fuck me. <laughs> Ow! Hey, Andrew Goldman, I have two kids. Someone wanted to fuck me two times. <laughs> Maybe three. You know, but it was, it was just, you know, and then like his editor was sort of like, ah, eh, you know, he just needs to be more careful. And then the ombudsman's no, it's like, we don't talk to readers that way. And he was suspended and it was this huge thing. And CNN did a story. And I think they even had like a poll on the crawl, like, you know, log into CNN.com. And would you want to sleep with Jennifer Weiner? <laughs> that did not actually happen. But, um, you know, it, it's like, 
you, you bang on the door and you bang on the door and you bang on the door and people say you're just jealous and people say if you wrote better books, the Times would review them and then I have to be like, no, they review Dan Brown, so actually that's not the case. And I'm sorry, it's like, you know, he does what he does really well, but I, you know, he's not Chaucer. So, but, but what finally, finally happened is um, the Times hired a new editor for the Sunday Book Review and she's a she. And she's very aware of the gender issues and she's taken steps, not in any big dramatic way, but just steps to make the tent bigger. So if you read the by the book column, sometimes it's Jeffrey Eugenides and sometimes it's Sting or Lena Dunham or Mary Higgins Clark or someone you've actually heard of and have read and enjoyed. Um, and on Valentine's Day, they covered four romance books, which I don't think has ever happened in the Times. And then today they reviewed four books by women, including All Fall Down. Yes, I know, it was great. You know, and basically said, like, you know, there's, there's nothing surprising in this book, but it is incredibly compulsive reading anyhow, and Jennifer Weiner does what she does really well, which is about the best I could have ever asked for from the Times. And so I, I'm able to sort of like point to this and show my daughters and say, look, they reviewed Mommy's book, but look, they also reviewed books by three other ladies. And isn't this great? And you know, I'm not sure they, they care or get it quite yet, but I think that someday they will. And I, I talk to them all the time about like, if you have a voice and if you have a platform and if you're lucky enough to be in a position where when you talk, people listen, you are obligated as a moral person to try to use whatever voice and power you have to make things at least a little better for whoever's coming next. And one of the things that people asked me on this tour that like, it, it was really surprising. Somebody last night was like, how do you handle fame? And I'm like, huh? Like, cause being a, a quote unquote famous writer is a lot like being a famous potter. Like, <laughs> like, first of all, unless I've just had my hair done and taken a lot of time with my makeup, I rarely look anything like my author photo. So I get to sort of like be in the world like really anonymously, which is, which is perfect. Like I, I just, I can't imagine I know Alicia Silverstone was here and we were talking in the green room about what it's like to be sort of that kind of famous. And first of all, Alicia Silverstone amazes me, like the whole like pre-chewing her children's food. Like I, I can barely be bothered to make lunch, let alone chew for them. So like the chewing, they're on their own. But like that kind of fame where like every time you step out the door, like you have to be you with a capital Y, like not interested in that. But I, I am, um, interested in getting to a place where I can actually do some good for other people. And so the thing that people ask on this tour is like, when did you know that you'd made it? And I think about all of the moments that have sort of like defined my career, like selling the first book and telling my mom I'd sold the first book and having the first book on a bestseller list and having a book turned into a movie and like going to the premiere of the movie with my mother and my brothers and my sister and my Nana and going to the after party at Spago and having a man ask for my gay mother's phone number. <laughs> and um, having my Nana at the end of the night, all of us are laughing about this except Nana, not laughing, okay? Nana poking my mother in her arm with her pointy red fingernail and saying, you see that, Francis? You see, if you just wore a little lipstick, you could get right back in the game. <laughs> um, you know, having a book number one on the Times bestseller list, like, I, Amazing, amazing, amazing moments. But the moment that I think of is, um, it has to do with another author, um, Sarah Pekkanen, who was a debut author like five or six years after my first book came out. She and I have the same editor. She was also a former newspaper reporter who became a novelist. And my editor called me and she's like, look, we're really having trouble getting this book any kind of attention. Um, the world had changed since my first book came out. The economy had changed. Um, there were all of these self-published titles and eBooks. There was a lot of competition. Her book was being published as a paperback original, which meant that it, it was a better price point, but it wasn't gonna get any reviews because critics just ignore those books. And she said, is there anything that you could do to help like maybe tweet about it or something? And I said, I think there's something we can do. And I decided to do a one day giveaway where anybody who pre-ordered Sarah's book, I would send a signed copy of a book of mine. 
And I thought like, okay, maybe like 60 or 70 people are gonna take me up on this. Um, 468 people, I think, like sent their receipts and bought Sarah's book. And so my assistant and I turned my dining room to like the shipping center. We had like, you know, V carts and we're like wheeling books to the UPS store. And um, Sarah's book made the Amazon top 10 and it made the Barnes and Noble top five. It went into a second printing before it was even published. And best of all, people started writing about the contest and then also about the book. So it was sort of this like runaround way to, to get review attention, to get people to say, you know, well, what is this book about? And as amazing as it felt to get my book on the bestseller list, it was amazing times like 10 to get Sarah's book on the bestseller list. And um, I talked to my daughters, I mean, I let them see that. And I let them sort of like all day long, we were like watching the Amazon numbers get lower and lower and lower. And, um, you know, I want them to see me like using my powers for good and not evil. And I want them more than anything else to be resilient. Like people talk about like, you know, what do you want for your kids? And I think the easy answer is happy. I want them to be happy. But that's not what I want for my daughters because I know that it's not possible um, because somewhere out there is a guy who will break one of their hearts or a girl, like equal opportunity, um, or a boss who won't like them or a professor who will be mean to them or a roommate who will be bitchy. Like there's a party they're not gonna get to go to. There's, there's something they'll want they won't get. That's life and, and we all know it. And I don't want, I don't wish for a life free of bumps in the road because I think getting over those bumps and learning from them and getting better from them is, is what makes us good people. I want my daughters to be resilient. I want them to know that they have the resources to go through something really, really sad or really disappointing, whether it's a parent dying badly or a TV show getting canceled or like whatever it is that you thought was gonna quiet all the voices in your head that say you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not worthy enough. If that thing doesn't happen, you gotta get through it. And what I'm hoping for my girls is that they will learn from me that I'm sort of modeling ways to get through it and sort of come out stronger at the end. And so um, that is my little inspiring sort of fakey graduation speech to you, the class of 2014. And I would love to take your questions about books, movies, gay moms, dead dads, um, anything, and my oeuvre. God, I love saying that. This is great. If we could just turn the lights up a little so I can see your lovely smiling faces. That's what, thank you, thank you. I, I do Bikram yoga, and so there's this one pose where it's like you have to pick up your, your foot and then stretch your leg out and then touch your forehead to your knee, and then, and then the instructor's like, and let me see your lovely smiling faces, and I'm always like, ah! <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> yes? Hello, the mic is coming. You're being descended upon in two directions. <laughs> Thank you. They're like triangulating. Hi. Hi. Jennifer, I'm curious how the New Yorker profile came about and oh. what you thought of it. Oh, wow. That's the first, you're the first person who's asked that. Okay, how it came about was um, Rebecca Mead, the reporter, emailed me and said, I'm interested, can I write a profi profile of you? And I thought about it a lot because I'm like, oh, this, this could be, the, it's the New Yorker. Like, they could be awful. They could go really hard on the books. They could go really hard on me. Um, I'm probably gonna have to talk about my dad because like, what if she finds out about it, if I hadn't talked about it and then she thinks I'm lying or covering stuff up. Um, I think that what I ultimately decided is that I believe in women being real. And if that's what I believe, then I have to live that. Like, I, I can't stand it when I open People magazine and I see some actress with like her lovely groomed brood of children and then in the side of the picture there's like an arm or some hair and that's the nanny. That's the nanny she doesn't talk about having but I know she's there. I, I was just like, okay, like I will do a story, um, you know, and maybe it'll be awful and that'll be something I'll have to live with but maybe it will be great or at least you know reflect me as i am and and demystify what it means to be a writer like 
I, I want to always be honest about like how I'm getting it done. Like people are like, how do you do it? And I'm like, I have so much help. You wouldn't even believe it. Like it's embarrassing how much help I have. I have an assistant and I have a sitter. I have somebody who cleans. My mom helps me. Like I couldn't get it done without a lot of help. And I still sort of suck at some of it. Um, but I, I wanted, um, I, I wanted to do the piece um, because I, I, I thought that having the New Yorker write about the whole push for more equality in terms of gender and genre reviews would legitimize the cause, would make it that much harder for the New York Times to keep ignoring me and Jody Picot and people like us. Um, and I also wanted to, I don't like the idea that writing and getting published is like some secret society where if you don't live in Park Slope, don't go to the right parties, don't know the secret handshake, don't know the right agents, you're never, ever, ever going to get published. Because I came to publishing differently. Like, I never lived in Park Slope. I don't have an MFA. I found my agent basically like cold calling. Like, I went through a, a book called A Writer's Guide to Literary Agents and found my agent that way. So. Those are all the reasons. I, I want. There were things I wanted to demystify. There were things I wanted to legitimize. You know, and I'm as vain as the next person. I mean, if the New Yorker comes and says we want to write about you, you're not going to be. Well, maybe other people would be like, oh, no, I'm a private person. <laughs> I thought about that, but no. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm very. I'm a shy and private person. Um, but I. I was really, really pleased with it, actually. I thought that she really, she spent a lot of time with me. She came to like three different events in New York. She came to a big event in Philadelphia. She had lunch with me, in Phila lunch with me two times in Philadelphia. Um, she talked to like everyone in my life. She talked to my mom and both of my brothers and my sister and my, like everybody. So I was really pleased with it. And I think, um, I think it moved the needle because I think that you can look at the times and who they've covered and who they've profiled um, and say, like, things have changed. So it did what I hoped it would do. What did you think? I loved it. Good. I, I, honestly, I've never heard of you before. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I still haven't read any of your books. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Here, wait, can, can you can come back and then start hitting her? Hit her, hit her with the, no, no, no. No, that's fine. But my interest is definitely peaked, and uh -huh. this, um, I, I brought a friend today, and we thoroughly enjoyed oh, your presentation, you. and you're thanks. my new hero. Oh, so my God. Thank Yay. you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank, thank Rebecca Mead, but no. And I, yeah, thanks. I mean, it's always a risk going into something like that, and you're always just like, oh, my God, and like the pictures, and I don't know, but I, I think it turned out well. So, yes, thanks. I'm glad you're here. All right, who else wants to? Next question. Next question. Hello. Hi. Hello. So um, following you on Twitter has made watching The Bachelor way more entertaining. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious to know whether that's something you just do for fun or if there's ways that that helps you as an author. Wow. That's a great question. Um, the short answer is I do it for fun. I have no idea if it helps me as an author. I know that there are people that, um, like every week after I do my little snarky thing, I, I sort of, you know, thank you for following me. And if you like my tweets, try my books. They're like tweets, but longer and with sex scenes. And um, every once in a while, somebody's just like, you write books too? And I'm like, do you think this was a job? I wish this was a job, but it's not. Um, and I, it's so interesting. It's like, I wonder sometimes, social media is new, okay? Like, it used to be that when you were a writer, like, the way that you existed in the public imagination was as a little postage-sized author photo on the back of your book. Like, they didn't know squat about you unless you, you know, made a, a big deal of telling them. You, you could be a very private person. And now the expectation is that you've got a Facebook page, you've got a blog, you're on Twitter, you, you're on Tumblr, you're here, you're there. And publishers, I think, are starting to wonder. It used to be they wanted you to do all that stuff because it was free publicity. But now I think there's, there's some concern that, like, are people going to buy books if they can hear from you on Twitter so regularly? Like, are they going to buy the novel Cow if they're getting the tweet milk for free kind of thing? Um, and and I, I believe, I, I believe and hope that, like, people that discover me on Twitter will be, like, curious about my books, like, curious enough to pick one up. Hello! Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that is, that is my, my dream. Um, and the other thing is, I don't, ABC does not pay me. I, I don't think ABC, like, I, I was really mean to, to Juan Pablo. Like, I turned on him early before everybody else did. I was like, he's like, he's okay. I'm like, oh, he's not okay. 
not even a little bit. But um, I'm glad you enjoy them because I really love, it, it's, it feels very communal to me. It feels like we're all there like yelling at the set together. So thank you for, for reading my tweets. Anyone else? Anybody over, over there? Yes. I love it. Thank you. Oh my goodness! See, that's like asking a mom to pick a favorite. It's like my first one. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, honestly, like they're all they're all special for different reasons. I mean, obviously, my favorite thing is always the thing I'm working on. So, like right now, it's like the the book I'm writing back in the hotel. I would start with Good in Bed. Um, that's the one a lot of people seem to like the best. And, and honestly, I'm not sure the writer is the best person to answer that question. Like, we never have the best take on our work. Like, good, bad, you know, does, is it going to, like, matter 50 years from now? Like, the writer, we don't know. Like, that, that's somebody else's job to, to figure that out. But try good in bed. I would start, I would start there. That, that is my advice. Yes. Uh-huh. You can talk loud, too. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a bookseller. Cool. And, um, I'm curious to know, as a best-selling author, your take on what's going on with Amazon. Oh, boy. Like, you know, it's Patterson, it's taking on the Ugh. Ugh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the way that they're stopping um, a chef from being able to pre-sell their books. Do you guys all know what's going on? No. Does, OK. Um, so Amazon, you all know Amazon. Um, they let me, I think I'm gonna get this right. They wanna be the ones setting the price of eBooks and they're getting pushback from Hachette, which is a publisher, saying um, you're, you're gonna price these too low, it's not fair to our authors. And, and by way of retaliation, Amazon is not selling Hachette titles. It's this really like ugly brawl. Um, and, and you will not be surprised to learn that writers have been discouraged from talking about this in public because you don't want to piss off Amazon. Um, having said that, I think what they're doing is reprehensible. Um, I, I, I think that um, it, it the, the word on the street with Jeff Bezos who founded Amazon is not that he went into the book business because of a love of books, but because he sort of examined the marketplace and was books weren't being sold efficiently and he saw a way to sort of centralize book sales make it very efficient without really being a book guy um, and I think that what's happening now sort of um, shows that he's not a book guy because it's betraying authors it's betraying readers um, but it's business and, and I kind of don't know what the answer is. Um, you know, James Patterson did talk about, he gave a speech at Book Expo America and, and said they're being bullies and they're being predators and um, he's still letting them sell his books though. So it's like, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer here is. Um, I know it's, it's very upsetting. Um, and like, for example, like I have, I yell at Waldman's book here with me today, Love and Treasure, which I highly recommend, and I urge you all to pick it up. Um, personally, like, what can I as a writer do? Like, I, I decided to bring her book before the whole Hachette thing happened, but for every writer like me who gets the book tour, who gets the ad in People, who gets the big push, who gets the big rollout, there's a really great writer getting nothing, because there's just not enough to go around. And this is regardless of what Amazon is doing or regardless of like, you know, a couple of years ago, Barnes and Noble wasn't selling Simon & Schuster titles for a very similar reason. It was they couldn't come to terms on co-op costs and the cost of, you know, how much a publisher was going to pay to get their books on the octagon table at the front of the stores. It's business. And selling a book, as much as I would love to romanticize it and talk about art and creativity and the muse, at the end of the day, you are bringing a product to the marketplace like milk, like eggs, like widgets. And you have to be realistic about that. And what I do to help as much as I can is sort of um, 
signal boost for other authors. Um, I, I, USA Today asked me for my summer reading list and I um, went through very carefully and I, I recommended really, really great books, but really great books that are all by women. Um, a number of them are, are by minority women and none of them got like the big bestseller push. So I, I hope that Amazon and Hachette like work this out soon because I think that readers are suffering. But I also think that like, we as authors all need to do our part to, um, to not just say, well, I got mine and rest on our laurels, but to sort of remember what it was like when we had our first books. Like I remember publishing Good in Bed and being like grateful to the point of tears for getting like a blurb or getting a great review or having some other writer like even like agree, like Jenny Cruzy like agreeing to like do a presentation with me when like it was my debut book and no one knew who I was. Like I model myself on those women and I, I, lots of other writers do too. I mean, it's a really lovely community, but that's my answer. I think it sucks and I'm doing everything I can to sort of help the authors that are getting screwed by it. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> more than you wanted. Question over here on your right. Hi, Hello. I, uh, I loved your treatment of body image issues in Good in Bed, um, along with Jennifer Cruzy's Bet Me. Yes. It felt like a very new thing that I hadn't read anywhere else. Um, do you see that as a new thing that's happening and what other new content should we be looking for in women's books? Someone asked, um, I was doing an interview for a newspaper and the woman asked, you always have these, these like overweight women in your books and don't you get sick of that? Um, this is not someone who had seen me in person. <laughs> and I, I said, no, um, because I write what I know, and so I like writing from my own experience, whether it is funny or poignant, or I'm talking about chub rub in the summer, or like whatever thing it is. Um, but I look at the world, and there are so few representations of, of, beauty is defined so narrowly. It's like, you know, skinny, 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 big boobs. And it's considered this like huge blow for diversity that now we think Kim Kardashian is hot, you know? So it's like, you can, you can have a slightly big butt too, ladies. You know, it's like, um, I, a couple weeks ago, there was a woman who lost like 130 pounds and Self Magazine asked for her picture for like their before and after thing. Do you guys know about this? This was on Twitter. So she sends in a picture of herself in like a bikini top and shorts and she has all of this like loose skin and, and rolls and stretch marks as you would after you'd lost 130 pounds. And so the editor said, well, could you send us a picture with a shirt on? And she says, why? And they said some nonsense about, you know, we always have shirts on in this. And, and she said, but this is what it looks like. And, and I was thinking, like, my first reaction when I saw that picture was, was shock. Even though that's what I see in the mirror, the idea that I would see it on my computer screen or in a magazine was shocking. And then a couple of years ago when Glamour did the story of, like, the model that had, like, the little belly, and it was such a big deal, she wound up on, Pe on the Today Show and in People magazine, our view of normal has gotten completely skewed. And anything that I can do, even if it's just words on a page, anything that I can do to combat that, to diversify, to make the tent a little bigger, I think is really important because I have daughters and because I want them to believe that beauty does not just mean looking one certain way, being Thin, being busty, being white, being young. I mean, I love when People Magazine does their beauty at every age, only it stops at 50. <laughs> I mean, should I just like throw myself off a cliff like after I, because it's over? Because there's no hope? Or like, I love watching Orange is the New Black because not only do you see all different kinds of races and not, all, not only do you see all different body types, there are old people on that show. When do you see old people getting their stories told? Old people who are not punchlines, like now that the Golden Girls is off the air. I mean, I, I love that they do that. And so um, in terms of other content, it's, it's funny. When Good in Bed came out and sort of took off, there was a whole spate of 
that, that was before like the big chiclet backlash of 05, 06, when you could still like write that book and not have people just sneer at you. So there, there was this little like boomlet and people started calling it, God help me, chunklet. Yes, but um, this woman, Joanna Edwards, um, it's Joanna with an H, but she wrote, she wrote a couple of books that had sort of larger protagonists. And I think um, there, there's also like now erotica, now that erotica is a thing, there's sort of like fuller figured erotica. So if you start looking, if you, if you look for like books like mine, books like jo Joanna's, I think you will start finding more titles because I know it's out there. Um, which is another thing I'm happy about, you know? I, I think that like, when I was looking for an agent for Good in Bed, the first agent I started working with um, said, why is the heroine fat? Like, does she have to be fat? Could she just be like Bridget Jones fat, where it's like 10 extra pounds and not really fat? You know, and I, I was, those of you who've read Good in Bed know that the heroine's like acceptance of her body is basically the point of the whole thing, so. <laughs> She has to be fat, you know, cause, or else it's just Bridget Jones with a bat mitzvah and I didn't want that. But, you know, I, I just, I, I feel that there's a space, you know, and I, I feel that my oeuvre fills it. So there you go, my oeuvre filling your space. That sounds perverted. Wow. Anyhow. All right, moving along. <laughs> Next question. Up front. Next question. Hi, my name is Crystal, and I um, was really excited to see you speak today just because I followed your books for a long time, and it feels like growing up with a relationship that's changed and grown, and each character, in a sense, seems um, related to each other but stood out on their own. And even though I'm assuming parts of your books um, you know, represent parts of your life, I saw them as their own characters. When I read The Next Best Thing, um, as I was reading it, I felt like a lot more of it represented just some of you in the last few years and just uh -huh. in my thought. And I was curious about how much of the next best thing um, really represented what happened with your uh, TV, show. With the TV show. And I know that's one of those things I can tell is probably not the easiest thing to talk about, but it was hard for me not to think about yeah. it as I was reading it. Just because I had watched some of the show and I had been interested in it and then it suddenly it went away. And right. I was, th my question is, um, how much of that book represents that, and what do you feel are your next projects with media or with any right. type of thing where you produce a movie or put your books into television like you did before? That is a great question. Um, for those of you who haven't read The Next Best Thing, it's basically a um, young woman goes to Hollywood to make a TV show and gets her heart broken. And she wants to make a TV show about a big, proud, curvy girl who wants to change the world and not let the world change her. And that is what I wanted to do with State of Georgia, which ABC Family optioned and wanted to produce. Unfortunately, the star they wanted to do it with was Raven Simone of That's So Raven, who had been larger at one point in her career, but by the time I met her, had lost 30 pounds and was completely hostile to the idea of sort of being a bigger girl even make-believe big girl. She didn't want to wear padding, she didn't want to be that girl, she didn't want to go there anymore. And I was really stuck because I, I so acutely feel the need for diversity in terms of women and body types on TV. I so badly wanted to make a show about a girl who was big and happy as opposed to big and miserable or big and the best friend or big and the butt of the joke. Um, and it didn't work out. And in retrospect, I, I should have walked away from it. I should have said, um, this isn't the show I want to do. This isn't what I came here for. Um, I learned a lot. And the short answer is, if I ever have a chance to bring any book to film or to TV, I will, I will know to pick my battles better. And I'll know sort of when to say, I will change this, but I won't change that and when to sort of go with the flow and when to dig my heels in. Um, it's hard when you write plus size characters and there aren't plus size actresses to play them, or at least there aren't plus size actresses that can quote unquote open a movie or star in a show. There aren't actresses people have heard of. It's like there's um, Melissa McCarthy and Gabourey Sidibe and no one. And um, what I hear all the time from Hollywood, like just about all of my books have been optioned. And what I hear is like, we love the voice, we love the character, we, she's so strong, she's so funny. Maybe someone will get pregnant and not lose all the baby weight, which is the most depressing thing in the world to hope for. 
Like, really, if you want to feel like shit, try like praying like, please God, protect my family and my loved ones, and let Tom Green's condom break so that Drew Barrymore can have his baby and not lose the baby weight quickly. Thank you, God. Like, I didn't want Drew Barrymore having Tom Green's babies. No. I did not want that. So, um, you know, and then they say things like, how do you feel about a fat suit? And it's like, not so good. Like, because you know that there are these incredibly talented women out there being told to lose 30 pounds. Like, I don't want them to lose 30 pounds. I want them to be who they are and like play Canny or play Rose or whoever it is. So I hope I'll have other chances. And I, I hope that, you know, I hope that shows like Orange is the New Black are making people rethink who will sit down and watch. Because what Hollywood believes is that we want aspirational, that you want to go see Julia Roberts, you don't want to go see the girl who looks like the girl next door. But I think even though Orange is the New Black had Taylor Schilling, you know, the gorgeous blonde, you know, sort of accidental convict at its center, they've broadened, you know, they've, they've, they've pulled back the lens and they're showing all kinds of women who look all kinds of ways. Or even, um, even The Obvious Child, which Jenny Slate is starring in. I mean, she's thin, but she's not Julia Roberts. Like, she looks like a person. And that movie's doing great. So I, I hope the world is changing and I want to be part of that change. And I hope that if I have other chances, you know, I, I, will, I will make the right choices. But yeah, it was rough. I mean, it was, it, was, it was sort of having all of these classic Hollywood experiences up to and including learning on Deadline.com that your show had been canceled because they got the news before, before the producers called you. I mean, it was, it was rough. It was, it was sad. Um, but I've, I live to fight another day. So we'll see. But thank you for asking. Other questions? Couple more questions, and then I will sign your books. I have a question. Yes, Stephanie. I, I'm wondering um, about your your male audience. Um, I, I have that. <laughs> I I can, I can has cheeseburger. <laughs> okay. Well, you're uh -huh. talking about your oof. My oof. Yes. And I'm wondering about that mm -hmm. piece of it. Uh huh. The dudes. Um, the dudes. The dudes. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Seven something like seventy percent of all novels are read by women like just across the board, like ladies are the ones reading make-believe things. Um, I do have men who read my books and not just the ones I'm sleeping with, um, although they have to. <laughs> like it's part of the deal, here you go. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I my, my brothers read my books. I always send them the redacted versions with like the sex scenes just blacked out. <laughs> You know, because like I don't want them knowing that. I don't want them knowing girls do those things. But um, I, I hear from men every once in a while, and it's usually like um, my girlfriend put this this in the CD player when we were driving, and I found myself really interested. Or you know, this was lying on her bedside table, and I picked it up, and it's really good. Um, and sometimes men talk to me about good in bed, and they're like. I didn't think that's what it really felt like to, to sort of be a, a big girl in the world. And just how much we internalize, not just as like, not just the size thing, but all the things that we as women carry around and how hard we are on ourselves and how harshly we judge ourselves. And I think that, I, I wish more men would read my books because I think that like it's some of that stuff's a real eye opener to them and could facilitate or prompt some interesting discussions. Um, you know, but it's always an issue. I mean, my publisher puts very sort of feminine covers on my books, and I can't tell them not to because if, if women are buying 70% of novels anyhow and probably closer to 90% of books like mine, it's like you can't tell your publisher as well, I would prefer a more sophisticated and gender-neutral palette. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, I guess the good thing about e-readers and Kindles and stuff like that is the cover matters much less. It's just this little like black and white thing that flicks by. So even though there are naked legs and cheesecake on the cover of Good in Bed, men can read it too. And I hope they will. Last question, any, any, any final thoughts? What do your kids read? What do my kids read? Okay, um, Lucy reads Carl Hyacin. She likes all of those. Yeah, she loves that stuff. Um, 
she finally read A Wrinkle in Time, which was like my favorite. And for the longest time, I'm like, Lucy, you'll love it. Lucy, please read it. And she wouldn't and she wouldn't. Then I got her, they did a graphic novel version of it, which she devoured and then went right to the book. Um, I'm reading like this abridged version of Little Women with Phoebe, which is really, really good. I love Little Women. And like when they're not like talking about like playing Pilgrim's Progress or some really long, like boring part, she's into it too. But she, I went to her like kindergarten celebration of learning day and she showed me her writer's journal and she had drawn a picture of me. I think it was me. It might have been a tree with hair. And um, it said, my mom is an author. And I, I cried. I was like, oh, Phoebe. And she says, well, you know, you are, but you are not a famous author like Mo Willem, who does the pigeon books, you know? Like, so that's like, she, she's like, in your books, there are no pigeons or no drawings. And I'm like, well, I could work on that. But um, the funny thing, the last thing I'll say was I, I signed 5,000 copies of All Fall Down for Target. They're doing a special signed edition. And Phoebe says, you are drawing in your books? And I said, well, it's not exactly drawing. I'm, I'm signing my name. She says, you make a little heart, which I do. I sign a little heart. So she says, could I make a little drawing? And so I figured, it mm, can't hurt. So she drew, like, in about 10 copies in Target have little pigeons in them. And the pigeon is saying, great book. So, it's the best thing in the world. Thank you. A reminder to everybody that there's going to be a book signing in the atrium. And thank you again to Lima Ray for the reception. Thank you, Jennifer.